Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, here to the Forum of Hydrogen and Fuel Cells Europe here on Hannover Messe 2022. We are live here, we are back again, and we have a panel discussion right now uh, with a clean energy partnership. It is about future truck mobility, discussing heavy-duty refueling path, and I would like to talk a little bit about the clean energy partnership. It's an industry partnership to establish green mobility with hydrogen and fuel cells. It unites technology, petroleum and energy companies, gas producers, car manufacturers, and suppliers to work together. Four of them we have here with me. Uh, I would like to welcome right next to me, Tom George. He is Chief Operating Officer of Clean Logistics. Welcome to you. Uh, next to him sits Nicolas Ivan, is CEO of H2 Mobility Deutschland. Welcome, Mr. Ivan. Dr. Thomas Acher, I would like to welcome his Head of Process Design and Development of Linde Hydrogen Fuel Tech. Welcome to you as well. And Dr. Nicolas Dohn, opposite of me, Business Manager Wasserstoff Westfalen AG. Welcome also to you. And you can participate in discussion, of course. Whenever you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll be with the microphone directly with you, and you can uh, yeah, ask your question directly. Mr. George, our topic is future truck mobility. And in Germany, we are committed to reduce CO2 by 55% in 2030. How will we get there? What is your idea? So my idea is definitely that trucks and buses, so especially heavy-duty trucks, are a major portion of this CO2 reduction, and that's why we have the vision to produce zero-emission trucks in large scale using hydrogen as the main energy carrier. So in the end, trucks are not the only thing we have to do, but they are an essential part to reduce CO2. To go that path, indeed. Mr. Ivan, H2 Mobility were involved in the installation of uh, more than 150 hydrogen refueling stations in Europe, uh, most of them in Germany, we have to say. Um, before we focus on truck mobility, just the first question, what do you think about passenger cars with fuel cells? Well, you may be aware that we have just uh, managed to attract a new investor. When I spoke to him and to the others we had in the panel, then uh, we, they, they asked us as well the question, what about the different segments? And uh, my answer was the, the business case now and in the next five years with hydrogen is in the regional hall segment. So what you just mentioned, uh, trucks for the medium distance and the buses, the business case tomorrow, so uh, in the next three to five years starting will be heavy duty and the business case thereafter um, will also be in the light segment. I believe that there will be a ramp up and I, I think that the likelihood is high that hydrogen will also have a significant market share there. But the uncertainties today in Germany are probably highest when we speak about those different segments for hydrogen. So you do believe if this, there's a ramp up in the passenger car, uh, area, we will all buy Toyota and Hyundai then, or even German or European car makers will go that path? Well, I'm an optimist, sometimes an over-optimist, uh, therefore don't, don't take me too seriously maybe, but I still, I still believe that the, the German uh, OEMs will, will uh, also uh, find that hydrogen may be a good solution. Um, maybe first Japanese and Korean cars, maybe second Chinese cars, and then hopefully third as well. Uh, cars from a German producer. hope you're right, indeed. Uh, Dr. Acher, um, you're from Linde. How many of these uh, hydrogen refueling stations we were talking about have you built? How many of them? Yeah, we, we take pride in uh, having um, constructed more than 200 hydrogen refueling stations worldwide and also ranging from a wide uh, spectrum of applications. So we talked about passenger cars, but we also have solutions for buses, trucks as well as trains. So uh, we have quite an extensive expertise for various applications in hydrogen mobility. And you provide these fuel, refueling stations with hydrogen, but this is usually hydrogen made by steam reforming, right? Yeah, well, this is the, the current problem we have uh, at the moment, that a lot of the hydrogen that is on the market is still conventionally uh, produced. Um, but uh, as you can, can see, when you look around this hall, there's a lot of ideas how we can make this greener, and for us, um, it is also the intention of uh, having the right equipment, the right technology that 
best suits the transition from gray over blue to green hydrogen. And together with your partner ITM, uh, you also produce electrolyzers for green hydrogen. What is the percentage at the moment of green hydrogen that Linda produces of all hydrogen? Could you tell me? This is, difficult is it one or two percent? <laughs> this is difficult for me to answer since, uh, well, I'm, I'm specialized when it comes to uh, the technology we have in hydrogen refueling stations. Um, but I, I know that also in the company there's a, a large intention of ramping up the percentage. Um, but it's a long way. I mean, we have expertise, conventional uh, production of hydrogen over, over 100 years, and now the expectation is to, to switch in a, in a relatively short period of time to a green production of hydrogen. It will take some time. Dr. Doan, building up a hydrogen refueling station is one thing. Running it is another one. Uh, your first uh, HRS was built in 2016, and uh, you're still the operator. I think it was not the cash cow so far, was it? Uh, we have our board member sitting here. should be super careful what I'm saying today. But uh, actually, I th I'm afraid you're right. By the way, it's Linda station. Uh, it's running very well. <laughs> um, no, I think it's one of the main points you're touching. Um, what we did in the past, what also Westfalen did in the past, is to hope to put a piece of infrastructure and the market will develop around it. I think we have to go for a more holistic approach. Um, approach where we partner much more than we do today uh, to have a system in place where we think from various aspects, various perspectives. I think we need to have the station, obviously, but we have to bring it together with the molecules. We need to have the molecules available in the right color. That means the uh, renewable energy directive um, uh, needs to be, let's say, um, uh, needs to be covered in order to make it a truly green and acceptable molecule. Uh, then we have to bring uh, the customers getting the, uh, the, the, the molecules in the end. And you have, should not forget one point, which is um, partners in form of OEMs, ideally, that bring the, the trucks, that bring the heavy-duty vehicles. It doesn't have any value if you bring all the other parts together and you forget the trucks. Um, in our opinion, I think that's one of the, of the crucial points in the next couple of years. Uh, the, the, speed, the speed that we will see in the market, in the ramping up of, of hydrogen heavy-duty infrastructure uh, will be the speed in which the OEMs, the retrofitters, like Clean Logistics, for example, are able to bring those kind of trucks into the markets. Uh, I guess we will not see um, two speeds. We need to have one speed together and to have one holistic approach to bring to the customer. And uh, if everyone is happy, if the customer is happy um, we can excel in that. Would you say it, it was a mistake not to think about uh, trucks at uh, the very beginning of building hydrogen refueling stations because a, a simple a passenger car does not take so much hydrogen, it, it will oh. not count in the end. Uh, actually, that's what we did. Huh? We, we, we tried to think two ways. We thought uh, in passenger cars, so we have a 700 bar outlet of our station, and we thought in heavy duty, we have a 350 bar outlet. Uh, we are so far one of the six stations that are publicly available in, in Germany where you can get 350 bar heavy duty standard. And um, actually it was meant to, to fuel public transportation, to fuel buses. So uh, I hope we have no one of the city of Münster uh, sitting here with us, but uh, um, there were four business buses about to come. Uh, actually there was one in 2020. We're still waiting for the three other ones. Um, but we see that bit by bit actually, um, we get questions from companies, from logistic companies, around the city of Münster that are super interested in buying trucks. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, very sorry, I cannot disclose those names, but there are a couple of big names uh, associated with it. And uh, actually, they, they ask for subsidies. And as soon as they have that, as soon as they have the trucks, we will see a ramp up. And actually, we're already thinking about increasing capacity uh, of our station. Will you b then build new, uh, new stations? Because they will not uh, drive 50 kilometers just to have a full tank again. Very crucial point. I think one station does not found um, kind of ecosystem. You need to have at least two stations. Uh, I know last year um, we had the luxury problem, so to speak, that after five years you need to check the tanks and you need to check all the, let's say, technical appliances that you have. Uh, and since we already started the station in 2016, in 2021 we had to reopen everything. So it was out of service for two weeks. 
that's uh, not a long time actually. If you drive a car, you take maybe a rental car at the same time, but as soon as you are a logistics company, that really hurts you. So as long as you have just one station around and everything is focused on having availability at that one very station, this will not convince the end user, the logistic company, uh, to make use of it. I mean, just imagine being in their position. Uh, it's just too risky. So I think what you need at least is a, a pair of two stations, ideally a couple of more, that are within reach uh, to overcome that point and uh, to be able actually to, to kick it off and uh, to come, what I said before, to come to speed. Right. Mr. Georgel, let's look at the side of the, of the trucks we want to talk about, uh, truck uh, mobility in the future. There are at the moment almost no fuel cell trucks on the road. We have to admit that uh, the first 30 hydrogen fuel cell trucks from Hyundai will be on the road in Germany this year, probably, hopefully. Uh, what else have, do we have to do? Do we have to rebuild trucks? So converting trucks from diesel propulsion systems to hydrogen propulsion is definitely one first step. So that's uh, definitely our opinion in order to bring the vehicles to the market really quickly and to get the fleet operators in touch with the vehicles, to get the drivers in touch, to let them test and um, explore how hydrogen mobility works in the logistics sector how refueling works with the proper refueling stations. So that's definitely one portion of, or one bit of the whole game. So definitely one first step. I would be interested how you exactly do that. You buy the diesel trucks and build out the internal combustion engine and build in uh, some fuel cells and a hydrogen tank? Or how, how is it made? So it's not so easy as you describe it, but uh, basically that's it. So we are taking um, used diesel trucks, pull out the whole fossil diesel powertrain and the transmission and the axle and then put in fuel cells, uh, a buffer battery, hydrogen storage and an e-axle, so an electric drive axle and combine that with an intelligent uh, software system to have an appropriate energy management system. And what do you do with the internal combustion engines? You throw them away. Ah, you, you can sell it, actually, okay. so there is, a, uh, there is a market for that. So, yeah. That's what you do. There's also, we, we've been talking about trucks now, what about uh, fuel cell buses? It's pretty hard to, to find any, any fuel cell buses on the market. So you, do you do this uh, yeah, rebuilding as well? Absolutely. So uh, in the eastern part of Germany, in, in the north of Brandenburg, we have a bus running on hydrogen in the national park. Mr. Ivan, trucks and buses run usually on 350 bars, passenger cars on 700 bars. Most of your refueling stations run on 700 bars. Uh, will you uh, rebuild all your HRS now again? No. So uh, the uh, business case we're looking at, as I mentioned, is the regional hall case with buses and trucks. So every new station in the next three to five years will focus on that. And uh, as you rightly pointed out, one should think of customers and station at the same time today to make a project successful and to bring in scale, because scale only works if it's a business case or has a perspective to become a business case. So uh, we, uh, we uh, cannot and will not um, add a 350 bar outlet to all the 700 bar stations. However, um, what we will do are two things. So. Uh, First, there are some uh, stations in very good locations where we will build a new station. And there are a number of stations where we're looking at, a, let's say, a small scale add-on for 350 bar, which will in itself not be a business case, but which can be an enabler to bridge one, two years in a relatively fast way so that customers in that region can start with the first buses or first uh, utility vehicles whilst we build a bigger station or someone else build a bigger station and we uh, very much uh, welcome the fact that we are not alone uh, here anymore. Sorry, we were not alone, of course, in the past, but there were, I think, uh, three or four stations which were not operated by age mobility, so, so less than 5% of the stations were not operated by age mobility. Very much welcome the fact that others dare now, I have to say, to invest in the market as well. And uh, yeah, it hasn't the uncertainties have significantly increased, as you can see with all the activity around us, and that's very good. I, 
I know exactly you came to the market when we had this hen and egg problem and you said, well, let's build some, some hydrogen fueling station that this argument is gone now. But uh, maybe we should have taken it in, in another way from the right beginning. Uh, I, I just remember e-farm project, you know, they, they said, okay, we build hydrogen fueling stations at two places, Nibel and Husum, we have the buses there, we have the windmills there, we have all together, you know, the whole infrastructure. Will that be your next projects or will you still focus on uh, hydrogen fueling stations? Now, our core business um, is and will be to uh, invest in our own hydrogen refueling assets. So in refueling stations, serving hydrogen at publicly accessible locations to customers. So that will, that will stay in place. However, um, uh, the two, two ingredients for a successful station are uh, vehicles and the station, and the third one is production. And production um, uh, will increasingly um, become visible as a bottleneck as well. The yeah. key bottleneck has been in the past years the, the vehicle supply. There are some signs that this is changing. Um, uh, there needs to be a lot of uh, ramp up as well on the production side and therefore we are looking at the moment into uh, models how to, uh, how to collaborate, let's say, let me put it like this, and it's still open in what intensity we will collaborate, let's say, uh, with the production side. But we are looking into uh, concepts, what is the best way actually to uh, produce green hydrogen for those clusters we envisage, those regional clusters where trucks and buses um, will refuel. So the, the 70 million you got from your, the investment fund, uh, High24, and another 40 billion from your shareholders, they will run into new hydrogen refueling stations, capable for 350 bars. Yeah, around two thirds of it will be invested in uh, growth. So in the project I just described, in regions, regional hall use cases, always with 700 bar. So we will build uh, the core station, which will serve most hydrogen around 350 bar for buses and trucks. But every station should as well have a 700 bar because we want to keep that option in the game, definitely. Um, and two thirds of the money will go into that and one third, roughly speaking, will go into uh, optimizing and still operating as well the existing network. Dr. Achter, um, Linde has the hardware chain for compressing hydrogen from 350 to 700 bar. Wouldn't it be possible to provide uh, the gaseous hydrogen in containers at 350 bars and then compress it if it's needed, if a, if a Hyundai or, or a Toyota shows up every once in a while and then compresses just for them? Well, um, that, there is a variety of concepts of how to deal with this uh, um, with the supply of different, uh, different uh, pressure levels when it comes to, to trucking of uh, to refueling trucks. You can look into uh, the hydrostrider concept, for example, in, uh, in in Switzerland, how they do it, and the trailers they go to different stations, and then you have an extra an extra compression into uh, into the vehicle. But you can also think about um, solving this problem in the in the compression side. So having a a supply of hydrogen on a low pressure level, and then having uh, two levels uh, available for for refueling, and we also have concepts for this. And this is something that we. We also want to make sure that we are very flexible when it comes to the hydrogen supply as well as to uh, the de demand when it comes to uh, customer needs, different, um, uh, different vehicles that, that will be operated on that, that side. All of this can be managed. And one, of, of course, is also look into uh, storage concepts. Um, one, um, one crucial aspect is where, which pressure level you store your hydrogen in. And, um, it, normally, it's, it's also an interesting idea of having a, a cascade of pressures because of the technical details that follow when it comes to uh, the, the thermal management, for example. But um, this is something we're really flexible and can, can have concepts that are optimal for uh, the requirements of the specific location. Could you also imagine to have liquid hydrogen for, for heavy-duty trucks in the future? Yes. I mean, we already have, have a, a technology that uh, deals with the liquid supply. So we have a liquid supply of hydrogen, we put it into our cryo pump, and we have then 350 or, or 700 bar fueling. Um, okay, so you could give it directly this liquid is, as it is. This, yes. is. this is already available. We have some stations that are operated um, and we, we provide it to, to HD Mobility as well. We have uh, stations running in, in California. 
and um, this is something we already do. So I didn't get it right. In your trailers, you have liquid hydrogen that you bring back to to gaseous form. Exactly. In one in one equipment. But so this you lose a lot of energy with that, don't you? Well, you, you can you you use your um, your energy from the from the cryogenic uh, state also um, for the thermal management. So you you have those cryogenic hydrogen that can be optimized in terms of how you put your hydrogen into the fuel tank. When we look into the future, um, we see that that uh, we have a need to also make sure that the mass available inside the vehicle is is high too, and will, is something that will be demanded by the OEMs of, of, of trucks. So we have partnered together with Daimler to have uh, a, a new technology development called subcooled liquid hydrogen, where we directly transport the liquid hydrogen from the storage at the hydrogen refueling station into the vehicle tank, being still in liquid form, having a slight increase in, uh, in pressure. Um, this will make um, the mass available on site the vehicle much larger, um, enabling a, a large range that the vehicle can go. We have a small footprint of the hydrogen refueling station itself. We also have low energy consumption of the whole fueling process, um, which leads to tremendous decrease in, in total cost of ownership. I will give you the opportunity to ask your questions. If there's any question already, please raise your hand. I will be the microphone right with you. There's the first one. If you just would introduce yourself, please. Yes, uh, I'm uh, Georg Tinkhauser from Wien Energie and from the hydrogen department. And I have a question. Uh, so you mentioned um, uh, liquid hydrogen as a fuel. Uh, Daimler is planning to or announcing their Gen H2 truck to run on liquid hydrogen. What does H2 Mobility think about that? And uh, are you planning to um, build up completely new stations for liquid hydrogen? Mr. Ivan, what will so you do? H2 Mobility thinks the following. First, um, we, need to, uh, we need to scale this up. Um, otherwise, hydrogen will end up in a niche, right? And scaling up means that we focus on what's the next business case and what's the available technology to deliver that. And that is the 350 bar business case for the regional hall segment. And in addition, the 700 bar option for smaller quantities of hydrogen. So what we build now is the 350 bar high flow case and the 700 bar uh, for smaller quantities. Um, let's say in the box, which answers the questions, what is the, what is the right form of hydrogen for the quantities or for the vehicles who require more than 60 kilograms in every vehicle, right? So the so-called long-haul case or other, other vehicles on the road. In that box, there are, for me, at the moment, three technologies. It may be 700 bar, it may be subcooled liquid hydrogen, or it may be uh, cryocompressed liquid hydrogen. There are two liquid hydrogen technologies, one at a lower pressure, one at a higher pressure. So those are the three technologies. And as a company who is now um, long-term or wants to become a long-term successful uh, player in the market, we of course also need to strategically look forward and build competencies around um, these technologies. And in all three cases, we are currently uh, 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 talking to partners to, uh, to talk about the first pilot projects, right? Our focus is the commercial case now, and we are uh, about to pilot um, these technologies to gain competencies. And when the time is ready for a rollout, and when the market has decided which of those it will be, I think the market will decide, not politics probably in that case, um, then, then we are ready. Dr. Dohn, will Westfalen AG build uh, fruiting stations for liquid hydrogen? Uh, it's a very good question. Um, before coming to that one, I would like to add something. Because I think we are, especially in the, in the, in the let's say, almost very similar situation. I think we're always looking um, on an infrastructure versus truck concept. Eh? We put it in a bubble. We say. There's a truck and there's a refueling station and they have to interact and maybe it's uh, gases, maybe it's liquid, maybe it's cryocompressed or whatever. They all have their advantages and disadvantages, but we usually look at it in a, in a bubble. We, 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 we don't leave the bubble. Westfalen, by coincidence, we are actually covering the entire value chain um, from uh, hydrogen production to hydrogen transportation to application in the, in the um, refueling station. And uh, we think that the discussion, taking just the bubble, you know, the truck and the infrastructure, is just too short. I think we have to look at the entire infrastructure 
at the entire, let's say, value chain that is starting at the production. What we see today is that you have gases hydrogen available um, in large quantities, and you have liquid hydrogen available in, let's say, not so large quantities. There are advantages, there are disadvantages. Especially in the north of Germany, everyone is discussing about big pipeline networks. Everything is discussing that big industrial customers are, let's say, having a pull effect on more hydrogen molecules, and that there is a pipeline network going to be, let's say, built up, pulled by the, by the industry. But that, of course, can be utilized for, um, for uh, mobility applications if you connect those new hydrogen refueling stations to the pipelines. And what happens then is that you have gases hydrogen molecules available at the inlet of the compressor to your, to your refueling station. In such case, for me, I currently, status today, don't see any reason why we should liquefy that hydrogen and bring it then in liquid form into the trucks. On the other hand, there's a function of time that we have to see next to, to the pure technology question. Today, we're discussing about gases hydrogen. Um, in future, there may be liquid hydrogen imported from overseas. And we see that Westfalen has actually, since 40 years, we, we have climate-friendly um, fuels like LPG, we have uh, CNG, and also LNG. LNG, that's the liquid form of natural gas, and it's imported. So we don't liquefy it in Germany, it's imported in liquid form, we keep it liquid. So as soon as you have that available, large quantities to, uh, let's say, at affordable prices from overseas, I don't see any reason why there shouldn't be any liquid, um, liquid structure forming up next to the other one. And once more, we have, um, uh, we have made the experience in the last 40 years that there can be several forms of fuels applicable at the very same time, all having their, let's say, uh, roles in their niches. I make an example. Uh, since 100 years, you have diesel and you have auto fuel uh, for combustion engines. So for one such thing as um, combustion engine, you already have two types. Then in the last couple of years, you have CNG, you have, you have LNG, and it's all coexisting at the same time, all fueling one or the other niche. So I lack the imagination why it shouldn't be possible to have gases and liquids uh, at the same time, in, uh, as we have today, 700 and 350 bar at the same time. So what is going to evolve in the future, in, from our perspective, is uh, uh, actually not so important. It will evolve, and we're not able to, to, to handle all those different aspects it will happen one or the other way. I think what is most important is that we keep that in mind, that there are different technologies and they all have their advantages and disadvantages, and that we have to remain flexible and open-minded and need to, let's say, have access to those technologies so that the whole market can participate. Dr. Dolan, but how confident are you that trucks will run on hydrogen at all? You know, if we might get some e-fuel derivatives so uh, imported, and then the, the market may change completely, and we have the old uh, internal combustion engine uh, again, and you would be happy probably not to change your infrastructure too much. I'm not sure we're happier. I mean, um, uh, we are a family-owned company, and uh, what we want to do is we want to be part of the solution. I mean, currently we're bringing into the market lots of classic fuels. Uh, we want to be part of the solution. We want to be greener, and hydrogen is an excellent opportunity to do so. Coming back to your question, I think that um, you said in the beginning we have to reduce emissions, and by 2030 it's roughly half of all emissions in the uh, mobility sector. And out of that half of the emissions, um, it's the easiest way to just look at heavy duty. Uh, currently, we have in the range of 3 million heavy-duty vehicles, and 1 million out of this is responsible for one-third of all mobility emissions. So if we're able to tackle that one-third, we, we did a lot already. And we, we don't have so many options. Huh? We have the options you said, um, e-fuels, uh, that's a very good option. Uh, you can leave the infrastructure as it is, and probably we would be happy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, that consumes lots of energy, and um, why taking hydrogen uh, take into another form, have losses on the way, and then uh, go into the, let's say, classic route. If you have hydrogen available at large quantities, especially where you have a pipeline, why not going for, for hydrogen as a fuel directly? I mean, what we're talking about currently is um, we, we, we think one or the other thing. Uh, I would like to underline, I think it needs to be a mixture of everything. When we look at about hydrogen, um, or when we're talking about hydrogen, we have hydrogen not only in mobility, we have hydrogen as a, let's say, essential molecule uh, for, for um, uh, how I say, uh, industry, well, the industry um, chemical. Yeah. It, it will be there, it will be there. On the other hand, we're talking about uh, 
what we call in Germany Energiewende. I think it's an international word right now. Uh, Energiewende means uh, that we need to, let's say, harvest the, the energy, the renewable energy that will be fluctuating. And we do so ideally by hydrogen. So there will be hydrogen available. And before, I mean, you can take that hydrogen and turn it back into electricity and then put it to battery electric vehicles, to put it to other applications. I think if it's there, it makes sense to think about applying that hydrogen without any other form of change, any other loss incorporated, applied directly to a truck. And that's one of the, in our eyes, um, best versions to come to uh, um, a climate neutral um, mobility sector uh, without changing, let's say, our our whole infrastructure. But first, we have the renewable energy, Mr. George, and I've seen the battery technology has made enormous progress in the last years. They are becoming uh, smaller, they're becoming more powerful, they're becoming cheaper, and uh, we might see also batteries in heavy-duty trucks, so you don't believe it. We see them already in buses, we see them in light commercial vehicles, why not in heavy-duty trucks? What do you think about that? So I think we will also see them in heavy-duty trucks, and it all depends on the use case. So uh, when you want to drive long distances, you are really limited with batteries, especially when it comes to the refueling or recharging infrastructure. So when you just imagine all of the trucks at night at the uh, uh, gas stations on the on the German highways, and now imagine how, how to refuel charge them all with um, hyperchargers. In my opinion, this is not really solvable. So um, we really see the advantage of hydrogen when it comes to long distances. But when we are talking about short distances, even in the heavy duty sector, batteries can also be a solution. I sometimes talk to automotive engineers and they tell me, well, uh, fuel cells are a nice opportunity, but when it comes into mountains and mountain range and the, the, the velocity is not that high, we don't get enough cooling for these uh, um, uh, heavy duty trucks. Mm -hmm. uh, did you solve that problem already? So that's definitely a challenge because uh, due to the um, limited um, temperature gradient between the cooling fluid of the of the fuel cell and the ambient um, you need way larger coolers for fuel cells so uh, we already made a lot of progress in technical development and there will be also other cooling to uh, concepts on the on the way we see at the moment um, I'm quite sure that we will solve this problem and at the moment, from the tests we did, it's not a big issue at the moment. So our trucks definitely can solve that. Okay, good to hear. Mr. Ivan, what do you think about these uh, overhead lines for trucks? The National Platform for Future of Mobility recommends to build 4,000 kilometers overhead lines in Germany. You hate them probably, don't you? No, but my answer is very short. I don't think much of it. You don't believe it will come, will it? No. Well, the platform, national platform for future of mobility is quite influential, isn't it? Yeah. Yes and no. I mean, I think in uh, maybe in other countries, same happens. But in, in, in Germany, we, uh, we, we tend to discuss like if we were on an island and the energy transition would just happen in Germany. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I, I couldn't name one European market who is seriously discussing about rolling out uh, uh, this catenary uh, concept. Uh, and, and, and what about the rest of Europe? What about the rest of the world? Yeah, this requires a lot of coordination, besides the fact that I think technically and economically speaking, there are much smarter concepts than this. So uh, I, don't, I wouldn't invest too much time and energy, but others do, I know. And um, I, I can't, I can't uh, tell them not to. So uh, I, I observe it and sometimes think. Well, we will see. It's a competition, yeah. All right. No, I, I don't. I, I don't see myself in a competition with this. I, I, I don't think it will be a big topic, long term. I have uh, Sven Geitman here having a question. Sven Geitman, um, H2 ma uh, magazine. My question is um, about hydrogen costs. Um, I heard that the costs of H2 will rise at the filling stations. Uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Ivan uh, can explain uh, why the costs will rise and perhaps the other um, um, partners on, um, over there might explain if they are in a good mood or if it's good or bad for the ramp up of hydrogen cars. 
Would you like to answer this question, Dr. Acha? I think the first one was from, from Mr. Iman. Okay. <laughs> yeah, who, who doesn't want to answer questions about rising costs? I mean, um, uh, as you may have seen, or some may have seen, we yesterday communicated to our customers that uh, we will also increase the, the hydrogen prices. So uh, energy costs, or the, the cost of any every, every energy input basically has risen sharply in the, the past months. So between 30 and 50 percent, uh, uh, when you look at um, uh, power for charging or um, uh, fuel like uh, gasoline or diesel, and uh, we have or we will increase our prices by 35 percent uh, in one week. So um, that is um, just reflecting the reality that all the input costs are, are rising sharply, especially the, the well the energy input, be it power or natural gas. Um, so having said that, looking into the future, um, what, what needs to happen uh, in the hydrogen uh, space is that hydrogen needs to be more and more produced by uh, renewable power or as a feedstock. And this renewable power ideally uh, comes from uh, surplus power, so the, the electrolyzer should serve a purpose higher than just producing hydrogen. They also ser should serve uh, a purpose to stabilize the, the grid. Um, and they should use power uh, from a connection to, uh, to a renewable power source, be it uh, over a power purchase agreement or directly connected to a windmill or um, uh, wind turbine, uh, I should say, or uh, a photovoltaic uh, solar panel. Um, therefore, I think there are good reasons to believe that um, the cost of hydrogen in relative terms, so compared to alternatives, the cost of hydrogen for customers will be very competitive in the future and will increasingly be more competitive uh, in the next years. But here we're looking to the next two, three, five plus years. You would agree to Mr. Ivan, Dr. Acha? Yes, I would agree to that. But, but maybe also tackling the second part of your question when it comes to the business case or the impact on the business case of the hydrogen refueling stations. Um, for us, the key parameter here is the total cost of ownership of hydrogen. So there's the, the hydrogen cost itself is only one aspect of, of the whole of this whole um, um, key parameter. And I think uh, we still look that that this is decreased in the future, although the hydrogen price itself uh, is, is on a on a slight increase at the moment. And what for me is is even more important when it comes to um, how much business is involved in the hydrogen refueling stations is what we see here is the interest. Uh, in those, those projects, is the realization of those projects, and I think there we can see a, a, a dramatic uptake in the last month. Ladies and gentlemen, we are running out of time, unfortunately. I know there's another question, but I hope you can ask that personally to one of these gentlemen or to all of these gentlemen. Thank you very much for this uh, discussion here yeah. on the panel. Thank you for being here, and uh, thank you to the audience for your interest. <laughs>